for years I'd been reading about different Asian practices. I felt the most affinity to those. And it seemed like the places in my life that were the most dissatisfactory, that where I experienced suffering, where I felt like I was contributing to other people's suffering, seemed to have to do with habits of mind. And it se the more I looked into it, the more it seemed I, I needed to look at mind and learn to meditate. Couldn't seem to do it on my own, so I started looking around for a group. Um, I was in nursing school. <clears throat> a friend said, I know a place. I actually tried some different places, and she said, I know a place. My boyfriend lives at the Cambridge Zen Center. I said, I'm not interested in a cult. And she said, no, no, no. She said, they're just like you and me, regular people. So I, try, I went and knocked on the door and, and got meditation instruction and um, found it helpful. And I pretty quickly moved in and um, I caught Desan Sanim's last Dharma talk at Cambridge before he left for the winter, understood maybe a third of what he said from his accent that I wasn't used to, but found his energy delightful, lots of laughter. But mostly it was the community, it was the support of people, just you get up, you practice together, you go about your day, you come back, you practice together monthly retreats. At that time, Bobby Rhodes and George, uh, what was his last Bowman. name? Bowman, thank you. George Bowman were the only teachers at the time besides Desan Sanim, so my re early retreats were with them, mostly. And I just found it helpful in my life. Even my parents, who were skeptical, eventually said, Nancy, you're less argumentative and more cheerful. <laughs> so um, it just was a, a match for me, all in all, and I've just stayed with it mostly. I think the the together action, the the clear, simple teaching, the having teachers who don't emphasize attachment to them at all, but really encourage you to become, just realize your true self. Um, and just teaching us to be available and helpful in the world. When I first met him, I had no idea, and so I just, as I said, was found him delightful. When he came back after the winter, I had many ideas, <laughs> and I was scared and um, nervous, and had to. He he looked at me and said, "Are you sick?" <laughs> because I just had was so full of ideas and and about Zen Master by that time, and had to let go of those to see them and let go of those eventually. There's so many, but one, that I was the only student there, so maybe no one else saw it, was I, he, students would drive him places. And he, one night, he was in Cambridge, and he wanted to go have dinner with a Korean family out in Arlington. And so I drove him. And I knew no Korean, but I did know a few words from chanting, sort of more Chinese uh, Buddhist words and so they were very friendly we ate dinner and then Desan Sanim and the husbands and I sat in the living room and from what I could tell of what they spoke about 
It was mostly laid back, kind of Korean politics and Buddhist Choge orders p politics, and um, and the wife cleaned the kitchen, cleaned up after dinner, wouldn't let me help. And then she came in, and the whole energy changed. And Desan seemed like sat up straight, and kind of a light came on brighter and I could tell from the words he was using bull and Pope and you know son and um, that he was talking about the Dharma and a few things struck me about that or at least two one that was his passion that's what he really cared about and really wanted to share with people and he lit up when he was doing it two he, and, and I saw, after I went to Korea, I, also, I saw this more strongly, that he was very interested in sharing the Dharma with everybody. You know, not just monastics, not just monks, also nuns, and very much he wanted to share it with lay people, men and women. And, um, that was so clear to me from that night. And then I saw it more so in Korea where um, he had Bosonims come in to Dharma talks and he had them sitting in the, in the Zen room and you could see them. They could hardly bring themselves to walk into the Zen room. It, it was so uncomfortable at first. And then, but they, you know, he just encouraged them so deeply that they came in and then, oh my gosh, they were, they practiced so sincerely. So that encouragement to everyone, but including lay people and women of all kinds, was very striking to me. Well, as I said, I wasn't there in the very beginning. I heard stories, but people who were actually there can tell you from being there in person. But from when I started, and I was a very new student, so I can only see from that point of view. Um, but there was always encouragement and um, to just try. You know, to not check ourselves, but to just try. Um, if we were being earnest, then that that's all we needed to do. And there was... At Cambridge, and I think at all the Zen centers at the time, there was a monthly three-day Yaman Changjin. They were very, uh, many people came to them. Um, I think our, some, it, it really depends on the Zen center now, but we don't always have these three-day retreats. Um, and the, the residential communities were bigger generally at the time, um, not so big now. On the other hand, at least here at Providence Zen Center, there are a whole lot more non-resident members who come and, and come very gratefully and sincerely to practice. Um, I think the teaching has not changed. Um, the Kungam practice has developed, perhaps. We saw it with even with De Sansanim. Sometimes he'd keep looking at Kungans, and and something new would appear, some new aspect, or uh, and and so he'd share that with other teachers, and they'd share it with students. And I think that's been continuing on um, in this generation and will continue because it's hopefully we will continue to have a very alive practice. Um, 
in terms of thinking about the future, um, I, th I really think we need to keep listening and paying attention to what people young people in particular are looking for, wanting. You know, when Desansim came here, he wanted, he, how I heard it was, he knew the, the hippies were here and they were, they were sincerely interested in looking at mind and in even helping this world. And he wanted to come to a place where there was some openness to, uh, to those human questions. And we need to keep finding a, a way of being relevant to address the human questions for everyone and every generation it, as it comes along. And um, I know when I start tying into, sort of clamping down on how it was and how the practice should be, you, know, you can see this, then that ability to listen to and see what someone needs you know, or a group needs becomes more uh, not so available. So I want to, I think we all need to keep paying attention and listening. I can't say that I've ever in my life been very politically active in terms of going out and I mean I vote but I don't go to rallies I I don't do a lot of that but I try to I think the place where I personally connect and where me and where our Zen practice has to at least fundamentally connect with these issues is in helping us learn to not know, to um, uh, cultivate this before thinking mind, because this is where we can we don't make separation, and we can actually connect with this planet and and the people, everyone, even those we don't agree with. You know, and, may, and listen so that we can um, find what some common ground and listen to each other and learn from each other. Uh, that I think is the fundamental thing that Zen practice has to offer for any kind of topic, any kind of problem in the world. And then as people, each of us practices, we find who we are more clearly. And what does this person, what is this person's job? You know, when I look around at the world situation and what's my relationship to it, and then what's my function? And for some people, it's, it's much more uh, ac action, out political or social justice or uh, permaculture or um, you know on a wider stage or or on uh, our backyard but each person if if we're when we practice we become more ourselves and then whoever whatever our karma is we can use it This primary point, this when we do something, do it completely. Anytime we do anything completely, it returns us to before thinking. And then what? Then we get to see freshly. By doing that, it, it actually helps us have energy to act. Not only, un, not only see, but then act. Let's 
sitting here with you together in this interview.